Good morning, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, all good. You? Yeah, fantastic, mate. Fantastic. Good. It's slow though. It's slow going, isn't it, in the markets at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm going to put a piece out later today, kind of explaining my thoughts um, because nothing's really happening. But but yeah, it is a little bit slow, isn't it? Yeah, I just just I think we're waiting for the next the next drivers, really. To be honest, it it seems like there's a lot of stories that are uh, kind of floating around that that could drive the market, but none of them are really taking hold at the moment. They all they all seem to be competing. Yeah, I mean that sounds sounds about right. What's what's interesting is this oil move over the last couple of days, though, especially today, um, because back in March, you know, we saw that flip where yields weren't necessarily reflective of inflation. So it's just interesting to see that yields and oil were back rallying together again. Yeah, I think it's it's sort of indicative of the um, of the environment as well because I think part of the reason that oil fell off was more to do with the Delta variant in China um, than it was to do with any any sort of yield move and everything else. And I think perhaps that's uh, I don't know whether or not they're moving for the same reasons, shall we say? Because the way the way that I see oil is that it's the impact of the delta of the of the virus restrictions is perhaps more on it's obviously onto the demand and then by proxy of that is onto OPEC as well um and they they can always turn around and say well we're gonna we're not going to introduce as much supply to the market again they're managing it very well seemingly to keep the price you know at, at or above these kind of levels so I uh, yeah I, I do think that that's uh, that's part of the oil picture there that might not necessarily be driven by yields. I think it is still more of an oil supply and demand picture, and I think the yields are being driven more by the um, the Fed taper story that we're that we're seeing more and more of. Yeah, no, I can, I can definitely agree with that. Um, are we thinking that it's more likely that they're going to signal tapering um, in Q4? Yeah, I think almost without doubt now with the the recent comments that we've seen from. We see more more Fed members coming out now, um, almost on a daily basis, and they're all talking about sort of the September to November window of time, really. Um, you know, certainly all by year end. Even the most dovish are, are really saying, you know, like um, Brainard is among the most dovish. She was talking about wanting to see the September job report, which will obviously be released in October. Um, and for her, if that's you know if that's a strong report, then that. Uh, you know that certainly qualifies as substantial further progress. Bostic again yesterday reiterating that he's he's very bullish as well, and very happy about how things are going and wanting to get on with the taper. Um, and the one I mentioned yesterday in the um, in the opening bell as well, Kaplan was on the Odd Lots podcast, sort of putting his his thoughts forward on it. Um, and he he made a good point as well. You know that that well not a good point. He made a lot of good points to be fair, but just talking about QE essentially not being necessary at the moment now. You know, it's done its job, which obviously is to underpin confidence and potentially keeping it going for longer is actually having more harmful effects by benefiting disproportionately the, uh, you know, the asset holders and, and encouraging risk taking. So he's very much of the opinion that whilst they should get on and taper the QE, what they should then do is, is take their time over the rate hikes that it shouldn't necessarily be an immediate kind of you know sequence of right finish the taper crack on with the hikes regardless you know he, he thinks that by doing the taper it actually gives them a bit more time to consider the hikes which i i agree with i think is a good it's a good way of going and he's among the most hawkish yeah i mean i, I do agree with that but the, the way that i think central banking set up at the moment is that um the taper talk is really just to give them more ammo in the future um I think the maximum rate hike that we will see would be 25 basis points. I, I genuinely don't think that the market nor policymakers could hack any greater tightening than that. Um, and that's even still having a net buy as well on, on QE. Um, you know, we, we'll yeah. probably see the pace slow, but I, I really, really don't think that there's any real wiggle room to the upside for policymakers to go. You know, the, it's, it comes down to the labour situation again. You know, the labour situation still isn't good. The surface level data looks good. You know, the big print of, what was it, 800, no, sorry, 950K, was it? Yeah, um, yeah, it was. That looks fantastic. But when you actually look at the differentials between pre-pandemic and now, I just don't see the case for it, really. I really, really don't. No, no. I mean, I think a lot depends on how how much progress they can make on that. Because obviously, he was he was talking. I think most people are considering it the same that if they 
um, if they announce the taper program, then in reality, it should take eight months. You know, if you go at a pace of 15 billion a month, 10 billion out of treasuries and 5 billion out of mortgage backed securities, um, it will take them eight months to complete the taper. Now, if we work on the kind of basis that that I'm thinking, and I think you're probably the same, the same mind that that will probably take place almost entirely through next year. It might start perhaps in December this year at, at the earliest, I think, um, you know, then that still takes, that, that gives plenty of time for, for them to make progress on the employment side of things. Um, but with, yeah, I, I do agree that there's, there's a lot more structural issues there that they need to, uh, they need to be got on top of. But this kind of just gives them cover, I think, at the moment to actually implement the, the framework that they were looking at. You know, in, in those eight months, you've got to think that a lot of these transitory inflationary pressures that we're seeing are, you know, that, that eight months gives those time to subside as well. You know, supply chains can get more back to normal things, you know, that, that balance can be redressed. We might even see that instead of having a chip shortage that we've got now, then, then there's oversupply of chips as well. You know, there's, there's a lot of time. that It buys them time without having to actually touch the interest rates. And Kaplan made that point as well. You know, he said that they are, you know, this, it's still they're still very easy financial conditions, even when they stop QE. You know, you're still at the, you know, you're still at basically zero rates. Yeah, I think I think the the problem with QE though is that it's more of a a messenger rather than necessarily affecting anything. You know, it comes back to that myth of the plunge protection team now. The plunge protection team is merely the psychology of knowing that the Fed has some weird mechanism going on where they are able to lower yields. That's pretty much what it is. You know, yeah. that's why we saw such a strong rebound back in March 2020. Um, so it, it, it totally depends on how they message the tapering alongside, um, alongside the kind of market psychology. I think that's so vital. Um, there has to be that resurgence in things like the labor market, in things like, you know, showing that growth is stable. I don't think they can, they can just do it without providing that adequate messaging. And I'm not sure if the market truly believes that the recovery is um, enabled, because if they, if the market did, then surely yields would be up at 2% like everyone was forecasting. Well, yeah, I, I do agree there. Um, but I, I also think that that's perhaps part of the part of the messaging that comes with with this QE, as you say, will also feed through to lending. You know, as long as obviously the the idea now is that you've got, as I've mentioned a couple of times before, you've got the banks that are sitting there on a load of money. Um, you know, the consumers in. Well, yeah, I mean they they they've got capacity to lend if they choose to, without a doubt. The big banks, especially in the US, have. You know, so I'm talking talking US here because I think everything flows through from there. So, you know, they, they definitely are sitting on, you know, good, strong balance sheets. Like I say, the assets have been revalued higher, you know, so they're happy to lend. You know, the consumer in many cases is now earning, you know, the ones that are working are earning better than they, than they previously were. So, you know, I think, and obviously what, what they need from a bank's perspective to lend, you know, if longer, longer end yields can go up slightly, then that incentivizes them to lend as well, because their return on that, on the, uh, on the outlay there is, is improved as well. So I do think that to some extent that now we're we're shifting away from central banks to to mainstream banks and their lending now as a as a real barometer of how well the recovery is going because I do think that they need to there needs to be lending you know lending because lending also in the, it inspires confidence you know and if one bank lends and the other ones go well, hang on they're lending and we've got to lend as well because we've got to remain competitive and the whole thing sort of is almost a viral loop. See, I think it's a good barometer looking at lending. But the appetite has to be there from the consumer. Um, yeah, we saw the, we saw the the failure of the Main Street lending program, and the main banks found that after a survey done by the Fed, that the main banks were found to not want to lend by the Main Street lending program, even though they were only taking on five percent of the loan risk. Um, they didn't want to lend because the condition of businesses pre-pandemic was so bad. So surely that means that post pandemic, those, those businesses have either failed or they're in a worse condition. It, Hopefully. it has to, has to uh, allude to that, especially when you consider that, you know, most of the Russell now doesn't make any money at all. 
No, but I think if you're when you're looking at those sort of firms, like the firms that are listed on the Russell, generally they're going to be able to get their their financing through credit markets anyway, aren't they? Without going necessarily to banks and getting the bank lending, they can go to capital markets. True, mm. but then uh, yeah. uh, but then what does that feed through to large banks lending? You know, does that mean then that it's not actually that good a barometer? Do you see what I mean? Well, because... yeah, I, I do. I think they're two separate things. I think you've got you've got the kind of the the firms that are able to access the the capital markets. They, for, for rightly or wrongly, they they've got completely unfettered access to the funds that they need. You know, one way or another, they might have to pay up for it, and pay up a bit for it. You know, pay slightly higher rates than than healthier firms, but they've got the access. Um, but if you look then at sort of the smaller firms and the the consumer side of it, then they um, they're able to to access the uh, the credit markets in sorry they're able to access the lending via the banks rather than um, rather than going through you know they can't haven't got that same access to the capital markets so I, I kind of I, I separate them off into separate compartments when I'm looking at it that way so it's more the lending to small small firms that haven't got access to the capital markets and to the consumer that's the relationship with the banks that I'm looking at sure I think I did see a chart that showed um... Bank deposits hit an all-time high. However, 50% of these were non-operational because firms were basically parking capital as a liquidity buffer um, because of the pandemic versus yeah. loans originated by Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And since 2016, it's practically been flat, even though there's been this increase in deposits. Um, so uh, I, I, I would like to you know, watch that one more closely. However, at this time, I'm, I'm, I'm still concerned that that lending hasn't actually picked up over a quite a long time period now, about four or five years. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one to use as a barometer of where we're going. Or it's just indicative of where we are. You know, people don't want to borrow, perhaps. I don't know. Well, that, that, I think I think you're right. You see, this that's why I, I I'm looking at it because I think it shows, I think it's kind of the purest measure of of that confidence in you know, perhaps again if you you want to separate it out to the real economy, you know, and say right, what's the confidence in that in that real economy, you know, because you've got the smaller businesses, you've got the consumers, you know, if they're if they're all confident, you know, and there's that relationship going on where those transactions are happening, that obviously the you know consumers and small businesses are borrowing, you know, it kind of because if the consumer's borrowing, then that means they've got money to spend, and the small business thinks, well, that's great because they've got money to spend. Hopefully, they'll spend it with me, and it's kind of like that. So that that relationship is key at the base of it all. Yeah. So it's a good it's a good sort of confidence indicator as well, I think. So I mean, in in this case, if we were to see lending pick up i mean versus say the eurozone that's a euro mm -hmm. euro dollar sell right i think so i think so i'm 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 really struggling not to just be bullish the dollar against everything at the moment yeah oh, except, maybe, except maybe the maybe the pound you know i think the uk has got its own separate thing going on uh, yeah. but yeah really you look at you look at the aussie you know, and it's just, it, it's all terrible news. You look at the Euro and they, they, they've just done nothing and they've got all kinds of political risks coming up now as well. Um, yeah, you know, Japan, Japan's, uh, God knows, I mean, they're just going to print another, what, 30 trillion yen somehow, you know, just, yeah. just to sort of enact another spending plan that will probably not fix any of their underlying problems either. China, they're slowing down. They're talking about cutting rates. It, everywhere you look, it's like, not as good as the US uh, is like the best you could say, not as good as the US. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, on that point about the UK, I think there's a bit of a kind of a Brexit resurgence trade going on, um, whereby the pound have been battered by uncertainty um, over the last couple of years. And now we're seeing this kind of broad bottom that's formed since 2017 even. Um, we saw the lows back in uh, 2020, of course. Um, but since then, it's just had a massive resurgence. You know, it traded one spot, one, four and a half. Um, and now it's at one spot, three, eight, three, eight and a half, basically. Um, so I think there's further to push back up there. And I think 
but based on the growth differentials, you know, I think the IMF upgraded the UK to um, an even greater uh, growth potential for 2021 and slightly off for 2022, but that's expected. Um, I think, you know, versus you know, the euro, perhaps even versus the dollar, that's a strong trade to play back in back, back up into where we were at the the, uh, the Brexit referendum, which was about one spot five. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that 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 to me looks like a really a really obvious trade. Um, and and also as well as I still think that financial services are going to have a massive part to play in the in the future. And obviously that is somewhere that the UK is exceptionally strong. Um, I don't think we're going to get get away from that massively. Um, and likewise as well, if you take the other side of that and say, okay, maybe financial services might not be quite as heavy in there. Then okay, so what's the alternative? Well, it's massive infrastructure spending. You know that that's the sort of the main alternative, and you've got that with the green anyway. And obviously, a lot of the UK companies that are listed um, in the FTSE are going to benefit from that kind of spending as well, as they're all heavy in commodities, mining, and so on. So there's, there's yeah. a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons, as well as the sort of innovation stuff that's going on under the surface as well. There's a lot of reasons to be to be sort of bullish the UK and bullish the pound, and seeing money flow into the UK. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with that, especially with our skills although we're massively mismatched in skills versus employment those who are skilled are very very skilled you know probably yeah. some of the best in the world so especially in pharmaceuticals engineering things like that um and they think, and that creates jobs for others as well doesn't it of course yeah no absolutely um just touching back on china i think we briefly mentioned it when we were talking about um you know the the growth potentials and, and what central banks were doing um They've recently just said that they wanted to be easy for longer, didn't they? Um, well, they've <laughs> they're sort of then their their messaging is as, as clear as ever. But yeah, yeah. sort of you read between the lines, that's basically what they're saying. And there's expectations again of further cuts in the the reserve requirement ratio as well, which is essentially their main uh, their main barometer, I guess. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just looks like lower rates are on the cards for them, to be honest. That's that's the thing. At the same time, though, they were obviously not that long ago increasing the mortgage rates, if you remember. I think they put them up in Shenzhen in particular by about 0.6%, 0.7%, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So so they're looking at cutting these these ratios to try and free up capital from the banks and, and stop them from having to hold up so hold so much on the balance sheet. But at the same time, they're also making it harder for the banks to lend because they're that whilst they're increasing that spread, uh, and the pe people don't want to take on that debt with the prices where they are, it's it still doesn't seem it doesn't make much sense to me as a policy that's going to solve anything. Yeah, I mean, here's two really contrasting points. So, um, senior researcher at the Chinese Academy of Social Studies Institute of World Economics and Politics. It's probably the longest fucking think tank I've ever heard of in my life. Um, they say now is a good time for China to cut interest rates as domestic demand is insufficient and the US has not entered a tightening cycle. Um, now to contrast that, uh, China Beige Book, who I follow, uh, they're, they're really good on, on China. Um, mm. They say it's all uh, South minor, I can't even talk. South China Morning Post said why China is unlikely to cut rates despite economic headwinds. China Beige book reply was, it's also not needed and, and in any case wouldn't jumpstart growth. Corporate cost of capital has been sliding since last year, and yet borrowing continues to slide alongside it. Similar yeah. to kind of what I was saying with regards to the, the bank lending, you know, cost of capital is low, but people still aren't really borrowing that much. So in essence, lower rates in, in this fashion um, aren't actually going to induce much more demand um potentially it could do more so in china since rates are slightly higher um but in the us you know it, it just doesn't make sense um and perhaps even a rate hike could induce confidence paradoxically yeah i actually i actually think that's a very good point you know i really do think that would be the case i think if the us were to start to start hiking it would actually um you know in, in the right context not to do it in a rush or panicking or anything else but just in a sense that shows confidence in the future um i do think that that would feed through to other nations but with china i think i think that i i agree on the rate cut side of things i do think that it, first of all it won't help and secondly I, if they do it 
I'm I'm of the mind that perhaps they're um, they're in more trouble again than we've as we mentioned before than than they're actually letting on, because I I do think they're very mindful of the Japan trap and and the fast sort of high, fast cutting cycle that Japan went through was also uh, the beginning of the end for them as well. Yeah, I mean the parallels are, are there if they do start to to cut again. I think. Yeah. Um, I, I really think that solidifies our case for Japan entering, sorry, China entering uh, a Japan style situation where, you know, they entered the last decade after a really bullish run up um, and they basically flatlined on growth for the next mm. 20 years. Um, yeah. I do think the potential is there for, for China to do that. I think, though, what it would take is a lot of political sort of maneuvering. A lot more clampdowns on on public companies. Um, you'll see CEOs being arrested, for example. I think that could be sort of the the entering of a new phase out of Chinese crony corporatism and into an even more sort of um, how do I put it? Perhaps more socialist, even. You know. And then what happens to investment then? Does it dry up? Um, well, I mean, you would think so. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's it's hard enough, you know. It's sort of there's enough obstacles now in the current, uh, you know, the way things are going currently. If you if you then chuck in sort of greater state control in everything, uh, you know, yeah, that just kills it. Absolutely kills it. The only people that are going to want to go to China, and I think this is in terms of you getting those businesses in there, is probably going to be wealth managers, and it's still up for debate whether whether China would allow foreign wealth management firms in to manage their uh, their country's pension funds and so on. Which I think is they're hoping the, the hope now the big hope is that they will they will allow that with an aging population from the you know the Western firms, but really as far as sort of going there to to really set up and do business from from abroad, you know, I just don't think you're going to do it. And China obviously is going to try and favour their domestic firms. Yeah, no, totally agreement. Um, okay, mate, we'll leave it there for today. Uh, cheers for listening, guys, and uh, we'll speak to you later. Cheers, guys.